Hey gang, I got an offer for you today from LinkedIn. As business-to-business marketers, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you have direct access to build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measuring with their tools built specifically for B2B. And best of all, they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also rank number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of the Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Make B2B marketing everything you can be and get $100 credit. It's $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. It's linkedin.com slash MPN. P-N. Terms and conditions apply. The exciting and the fun part is having an idea, having something that you come up with, building it to a level that people are actually willing to pay for it and say, hey, I had an idea that is more than just an idea that now people are willing to pay for. Entrepreneurs Enigma is a podcast for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. So the wins and the fails that we all face being entrepreneurs and how we learn from adversity. Every week I talk to a different entrepreneur with a story to tell. I'm Seth Goldstein. Come with me on the journey. This is Entrepreneur's Enigma. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Entrepreneur's Enigma podcast. Today, I am here with Devin Miller of Miller IP Law of his podcast. What's your podcast called again? Innovative Thoughts? Uh, Inventive Journey. Inventive Journey, I like, I like that. And I'm actually going to be on his podcast, which I'm really excited to be on because it's, it's fun to be on other people's podcasts as well. And you also, have, you also have done three or four startups prior to this or during this or including this? A little bit of all of the above. The first one started when I was doing the law degree, an MBA degree, done a few cents, and also ran my own law firm. So all, all along the journey. And then he has his, his father startup with four kids, so the guy is not exactly bored. <laughs> we'll, we'll say that, you know, he's got his hands full, and I love it in his intros everywhere. He says, you know, family's the biggest thing for him, and I love that. So four kids, what where, where are their ranges? Yeah, so oldest is 11, youngest is five, so oldest is a, is my, is a boy, and then the uh, three girls, so. Uh, oh, wow, so every... you started with a boy. Started with the boy, so started with the boy and ended with the girls. Well, that's good. And let me guess, they all have you wrapped around their little pinky, right? Uh, yep. Yeah, they they all have their own way, their own ways that uh, we connect. So it all works out good. It works out great, my friend. So, so all right. So how did this all start? I mean, like like where you went to Brigham Young? Yeah. So undergraduate, or I guess, or educational wise. So I got four degrees, which my wife always jokes is three degrees too many. So I did dual undergraduate degrees in electrical engineering in the Mandarin Chinese. And then I got a law degree as well as an MBA degree. So I did, there, did those in parallel as well. So All right. So, so you have two undergrads and two, two postgrads. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I guess you can call a law degree a doctorate because in, in, I think in England they call you guys doctors. Yeah. I mean, technically it's a JD, which is Juris Doctorate. I got the graduate degrees as well as the undergrad. So kind of where I guess there's a, a couple points where it all started for me. So undergraduate. Yes. I was uh, wrapping up, uh, doing, you know, fo- I did Chinese as well, but the main focus was electrical. That's not, that's not an easy, and it's a major too, so that's like you had a lot of Chinese. But yep. that's not an easy language. I mean, it's a different character set, and not only that, it's a different mouth set. It's a different... <laughs> it, it's about as different as you get from English, so one of the harder languages for English speakers to learn. One of the English is one of the harder languages for Chinese speakers to learn, so it is definitely a bit of a difference, but... No, I, I was looking at that and saying, I was coming out of undergraduate and saying, you know, I like engineering, but I don't want to be an engineer. In in the mm-hmm. sense that, you know, a typical engineer, you're a small cog in a big wheel. You know, to have any impact on the company, you have to, you know, have 10, 15 years experience. You have to work your way up the company. And you, even then, you, a lot of times you don't really get the big picture. And so 
with that, I was saying, okay, I want to leverage the interest in the education with engineering, but I don't want to be an engineer. So kind of what do I want to do? And as I was doing that, I had two different interests or different paths that I was considering. And one was love startups, loved entrepreneurship, loves or, or those kind of business or type area. And I also found the, the legal aspect interesting, particularly in intellectual property, which is what I, mm-hmm. I do, which is, you know, I get, a, you know, you do patents and trademarks and, and copyrights and you're helping startups and small businesses and working with a lot of fun ideas. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of saying, you know, which one do I want to do? And if you're to go the old, you know, the old poem or whatever it is, is, you know, the two paths diverge. And I said, well, rather than go one or the other, I'm just going to plow right down the middle and I'm going to do both. So that's why I went. And why did. not? <laughs> <laughs> why do I have to choose? I don't have to choose. They tell me I have to choose. I'm just going to choose both. So that's where I do. A professional student, right? <laughs> I eventually graduated and got a job and grew up. But for a while there, it was about uh, nine and a half years of uh, schooling. Um, so as I was doing all of that, you know, that was kind of where my journey got going. And it was kind of, okay, mm-hmm. decided I'm going to go both and I'm not going to just choose one or the other. And that's kind of been my mantra throughout the rest of my career. So I started my first startup while I was doing the law or give you kind of context. I was doing the law degree. I was doing the MBA degree. I was working 20 hours as a law clerk. I had a two-year-old and we just had a newborn and then I decided to do a startup in the middle of all that. So that was kind of where the entrepreneurship really got started or my first startup got going. So you really didn't sleep. <laughs> I mean, yeah. everyone says when you have kids, you don't sleep. Well, you sleep a little bit, but I, I doubt that you, did you sleep at all? Yeah, I mean, now I sleep a lot. I sleep a normal amount. I usually get somewhere between, I figure, six to eight hours of sleep a night. When I would say for the wow. first seven, eight hours or seven, eight years of my career and throughout all the schooling, I was usually about three to four hours of sleep a night. So it was, it, I've gotten better. I've gotten a, a more normal balanced <laughs> life, but for a while it was, it, I didn't sleep too much. Well, there you go. There you go. So what was the first startup you did? Yeah. So the first startup, as I mentioned, I was doing the law degree, MBA degree and working and whatnot. And I said, okay, you know, I can't remember if it was a flyer or it was a um, email, one or the other, but it's basically mm-hmm. saying, hey, we've got, you know, it's a business competition coming up and it's a kind of a multidisciplinary. Everybody comes and, and, you know, doesn't know anybody and you mm-hmm. form a group and you do a competition. So I said, oh, that sounds like fun. Why not? So went and uh, went in, went to the, you know, little introductory presentation for my group and away we went and we started out, you know, the first year we entered and it was to, uh, I did to make gym bags less smelly. And it was kind of a fun Ooh, idea. Yeah. When the, in, in practicality and reality, I don't think it would have got anywhere, but it was a fun idea nonetheless. And so that's what we pursued the first year. Entered in the competition, took second place. It was okay, that was fun. We kind of split up the little bit of our prize money it got, and we all went our ways. We were all uh, juniors at the time. We are in our third or four-year programs. So next year came around, so we're all seniors, and said, yeah, we had a fun time last time. Why don't we do something again? And I said, well, we don't. None, nobody's really interested in picking up where we left off on the other idea. So I said, why don't we start hey, something new? Yeah. So, so we uh, were looking at it and, you know, brainstorming. We had stupid ideas like self-packing boxes and other things that would have never worked, but were kind of fun ideas. But the one I remember is, uh, was after a brainstorming session, I was walking home and was kind of, you know, just uh, thinking uh, about what could uh, or our project be. And the one I was thinking about is I'd started, I'd always enjoy, I don't know, I like to run or I like the benefits of running. So I usually run about nine miles every day. And so um, wow. was doing that thing. I just uh, done a, recently had done my first marathon. And so as I was do, or after I'd done the marathon, one of the things I did horribly was I didn't hydrate very well. I was skipped too many Ooh. hydration centers and I thought, oh, it's going to slow down my time. It's going to impact it. And I'm not going to. So I decided I would only drink about half the hydration centers. Big mistake, got dehydrated. I still finished and it was fine, but it you know, makes it more painful. So I said, wouldn't it be cool if you had a watch that could tell you what your hydration level was? And this, yeah. this was in the days before Fitbit or iWatch or any of those. And so there wasn't wearables out there. But I said, oh, that'd be kind of cool. So I called up my dad, which was also an electrical engineer and had some medical device experience. and said, hey, got an idea. How do you think we could build this? And so we kind of bounced it off, or off each, each other. Um, I pitched it to the group. The group thought it was a cool idea. So I went home over Christmas break and me and my dad built up the first prototype. And oh, wow, then we... Cool. Um, entered in the competition, took second place, which I'm still bitter about because we should have taken first. Uh, But that was kind of the 
or the beginnings, and then we got to the end, and we were all going to graduate, and we said, we're all going to go different ways, different country, you know, different states, and everything else. And said, well, I don't think it's a good way to do a startup, but I still, I still think there's a lot of value into this idea and this prototype that we did done, did beyond just a business competition. So I bought out all the the rest of the partners or the you know the people in the in my group and started that as a legitimate or, or the first business. So that was kind of my first entrance into entrepreneurship um, in addition to just or pursuing a legal career. Wow. So you did that. And so how'd that go? Did, did you exit? Did it, did you learn a lot? Like, you know, cause a lot, I mean, a lot of people, people see entrepreneurship and startups as, you know, either win or you lose. It's not that it's either you do a good exit, you keep it going, all that, or you learn a lot and you apply it to the next thing. Yeah, and I'd put it kind of both. So certainly learned or learned plenty. It's still a, a, an active business now. It's pivoted and wow. evolved since then. Um, so kind of just to fast forward through the story a bit. So graduated, and I was doing full time legal career. I was always also doing this as a full time uh, side hustle. In other words, I always look at wow. side hustles as a second full time job because you end up spending yeah. as much time on them, if not more. If not more, but. So graduated, bought out the partners and decided, okay, I need some additional talent. So I pulled in some of my, or my dad, some other people I knew, got the startup up and going. We uh, developed a couple more generations of the prototype, brought on an investor, got some additional money. And about the time we were going for our our next round of fundraising to really polish the product, make it more um, ready for the public and those type of things, we were shopping it around and kind of looking at different deals. And we got connected with somebody that was doing um, diabetes monitoring. Now, what they were doing for for the ecosystem and call centers and that type thing, they didn't have as much technology, but the technology we developed slotted in really well. There's a lot of overlaps with measurements we're making and the way we're doing it with monitoring diabetes. And so we ended up making a merger with that company, um, you know, kind of bringing those two companies together. And uh, that's where it's at today. So that company is... That's Soft launch, it will probably more legitimately launch next year um, with um, a lot in the diabetes monitoring uh, arena. And I took it, you know, as it, it was merged, I was having a few other businesses and pursuing the law firm that I was starting and other things. Mm-hmm. So I still have been involved. It was, I took a bit of a step back. So still not, not nearly as actively involved, still participate, still. But <laughs> that was, so that was kind of where that's at today. So that was kind of the, the real, so that one's still going, still, uh, still live and still, awesome. uh, still a fun company. We're going to take a quick break here from our sponsors and get right back to the show. Hey there, it's Jason Falls. If your company or maybe one of your clients sells to marketers, you look for advertising channels that guarantee business marketers are paying attention, right? Let me introduce you to the Marketing Podcast Network. You're listening to it right now. It's a network of podcasts all about marketing. So 100% of MPN's audience are marketers. Reach them by advertising on the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more and find our media kit at marketingpodcasts.net. Then you have your IP law, which I think is, is awesome, which is it's your own business, which is a perpetual startup, I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> because when it's your own business, like Goldstein Media, it's a perpetual startup of 13, four, actually 14 years. But it's yep. always going to be a startup because it's constantly iterating. I love how you have your podcast. You have this, the small business aspect. You have like the document center thing, which is really cool. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, Yeah, so we have a a few different aspects of the business, branches of it. So one you mentioned is a podcast, and we have a ton of startups and small businesses on to talk about the journey of kind of how they got there, where they're at today, kind of like what I just walked through, and um, always fun to have them on. Um, We also do the the law practice in and of itself. So we do, you know, have myself, a few other attorneys, some support staff um, that does uh, patents and trademarks and copyrights and other business-related things. Uh, things uh, to service start us as small businesses and then more recently we've also added on to that we also do you know diy legal products and so that's awesome now, now i'll caveat you know it, there's other diys out there i just think they all suck so i mean hey it, if you can that's the thing if you see it but you can do it better yep. it's all that matters like if you think you can do it better then do it, it, it every competi- things are better with competition I, oh, I agree. So I looked at it when you're wanting, needing legal help, you either have kind of two options. One is that you're going to say, okay, I can go and hire an attorney and I have to have the budget and attorneys aren't cheap and, you know, they, they cost yeah. money and they have a high available hour, which they also went to a lot of schooling and have a lot of debt. And so they, exactly. they, they can command that. Just like, do- just like doctors, you know, yep, exactly. why they're so expensive. It's because 
they're not making a whole lot of money. They're just paying off the damn debt. Exactly. Their law school's not cheap, as I could definitely attest to. So that's your one option. The other option is, okay, well, I can't afford an attorney, so I'm going to go and Google it, maybe watch a YouTube video or two, try and find a template somewhere, and hope and pray that that's the right thing that needs to be done. And that's really your, your two things. And this latter option, you know, if you can afford an attorney, I definitely recommend it. They're worthwhile. They provide the best service. But the other option of just Googling it and maybe watching a YouTube video usually doesn't turn out very well. And so it felt yeah. like, you know, there needed to be something there in the middle that was better than the other DIY options that really were just a minor step up above uh, just watching mm -hmm. the YouTube video. And so that's where we created our own uh, DIY option, which is... We integrate it with videos. We integrate it with walkthroughs. They have the option it. to have an attorney review it at the end if they want to do that. And so it's kind of offering that for, hey, you may not be able to assort, afford our services right now, but you need to get going. So let's do a mm -hmm. DIY option. So that's kind of one that we have spun out as well saying, hey, we're, our mission is to help startups and small businesses. And what is another way that we can help them? And here's, here's another avenue. Love it. Love it. Love it. And so here's a question. Do, do any of your kids have the entrepreneurial spirit like you do? Uh, do you see your 11 year old going in and saying, dad, I, w I built this contraption. Let's, let's go for it. You know? Yeah. He, he, he has a more, I don't know, entrepreneur business spirit. And I'd say that they're, while they're related, they're not quite the same thing. So he loves, so one of the businesses that I have, is a very small, just kind of fun family business. It doesn't make a ton of money. It's like 15, 20,000 a year, but it That's makes something. Yeah. But, you know, but it makes enough that I can hire my son and he does a lot of the little or a lot of work for it. And it's a, it's a pretty uh, small, this is a little religious products uh, business that we just have an online store and it sells. But he can come in and he comes in once a week, does some work for it. He gets to earn money. He gets his own little office. It's not a grand office by any means, but old little office, his little desk. He gets to come in. And so he gets the experience of working for a startup or a small business, gets to earn a little bit of money, gets the value of money, gets to see that you don't you can actually do a business yourself you don't have to wait till after you go to school and so yeah so he he has that i don't know that he has the hey i'm gonna pitch 100 ideas and always coming up with a new idea but he has more of hey uh, it has more of that business mentality of i'm gonna work and, and but at 11 years old that's fantastic and plus he gets to hang out with that which is exactly cool. it makes it really fun yeah that's good it's like kind of like, like some some parents do sports and all that stuff do you guys do, do kids play sports too yeah, all the kids are at least in one sport. We kind of have, I don't know, a rule. If they really hate us. How sport. do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here. I have one kid, and I'm exhausted. You have four kids, and, and then you, all your startups are babies, too. You know, they're all like, wow. I'm impressed, and that's a good thing, you know. But here's a question. Sure. What is the scariest thing of, about entrepreneurship for you? Yeah, I think the scariest thing, th there's a few things. I'll go with the mm -hmm. scariest, but I can, I can name a few, but... Probably what most people I think would say is the scariest thing is making the leap over to entrepreneurship, which I would put up there as being scary, but it wouldn't be the scariest because you make the leap over. If it fails, you're probably early enough on you're just going to go get another job and you'll, you know, you'll probably go work for someone else if it doesn't work out. I think the scarier thing is once you get it to a level that is doing well enough that you're now invested, it's now growing, and then you start to learn all the things that you really didn't think about at the beginning because you're just excited to get the business going. And you're saying, now here's all the things that can sell. And you see, okay, we had a ramp up, and now it's it's dipping down a bit. And is that going to go back up or is it going to go down? And you know, now we have employees onwards. I started out myself and it was just me. And if it was me and I couldn't make payroll, I was the only one that I had an obligation to. Now I got all these other people that I got to make sure that they get paid. And I think once it hits that kind of first crescendo beyond on the, hey, I'm going to try and go do something on my own and start it out. But really now when you start to take on more obligations and build it beyond that first kind of idea stage to a legitimate business, that's where it starts to get probably the scariest point. There you go. I mean, that's that, that's interesting because I know a lot of people are like taking the leap. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's the ultimate, ultimate amount of business that's commission-based because literally if you don't make the money, there's no draw. It's It's it. Like, you know. But also, what's the best thing? I mean, I love asking this of parents because I think I know the answer most parents say, but like I love hearing from their mouths because I think it's true. Yeah, I'll break it into the kind of the parent side and then just the me business side. You know, yeah. I, for me, we already touched on it. The most, the the most, the funnest thing for me has been, or the most exciting has been to be able to have opportunities to let my kids be or participate. So all of my kids, in a former fashion, work for one of my businesses. 
Oh, now, I love that. So, you know, some of them is just they come in on a Saturday, they help clean dad's offices, they vacuum, they melt. That's nice. And so, you know, do they do the best job as if I were to go hire a cleaning company? No. Do they do a good enough job to keep the office nice? And do they get a little bit of spending money and they get to learn how to uh, actually earn money and, you know, be a, a participate mm-hmm. and do that? And it's been, that's been really gratifying. If I were to say, aside from the parenting side, which is the most gratifying, for me, it's the exciting and the fun part is having an idea, having something that you come up with, building it to a level that people are actually willing to pay for it and say, hey, I, I had some, I had an idea that is more than just an idea that now people are willing to pay for. And, you know, you can, you can build it and make it a bigger company. And some of the companies I built are now seven and eight figure business. That's always fun. But for me, the big, the most fun is to say, hey, I had an idea. I did something with it. And people were actually willing to pay me for it. I love it. That's perfect. So, Devin, where can people find you? Where's the best place to connect with you? Yeah, so I'll give a couple. One is if they want to reach out to me with the intellectual property law firm, we offer services and definitely love helping start small businesses. They want to get a one-on-one session with me. They can uh, go to strategymeeting.com, grab a 15-minute consultation, or free of charge. We'll just sit down and talk through what you have going on with your business, some things to consider, and uh, if we are able to help you or not. So strategymeeting.com, that's a great place. That also links to our website, so you can check out all of our prices. You can, we have a ton of content. We have video, oh, we great. have audio, yeah. we have blogs, we have anything that, or all any way that you like to learn, we have it. And then the other one is if they want to, I'm only social media platform I'm really active on. I know I have accounts and we do other things with them. The one I like is LinkedIn. And so if they mm-hmm. want to check me out on LinkedIn, they can go to meetmiller.com. That links to my LinkedIn profile. Love it. And so those are the two best ways to connect up with me. So, this is str- so strategysession.com and meetmiller.com. Strategymeeting.com. And the funny thing is, I wanted strategy session when I originally setting it up. It was, they wanted like $10,000 for that ah. URL. I'm like, I'm not going to spend $10,000. So I'm like, no. what's another way to do strategy session? I'm like, well, strategy meeting. And I went to GoDaddy and I was like, 10 bucks. I'm like, done. That's the one I'm going with. So, mm-hmm. I got strategymeeting.com. Strategymeeting.com and meetmiller.com, which I think is really good because Miller is a common name. And you got meetmiller.com. That's probably worth some money. <laughs> I'm a bit a, a slight URL hoarder because I, you know, I found that Me it's too. much easier to buy them when you have when need them, especially if they're inexpensive and they're available because they go like that. And I've had ones where two days later I'm like, okay, I'll buy it now, and they're gone. So I tend to as soon as I have a URL that I might ever possibly want, I go and buy it. So someday maybe I'll just bu- go yeah. sell all of them. But you buy it for 10 bucks if you don't like it, you know, then you just let it go next year. You know? Exactly. Or if you're like me, I just hold on to it forever because I'm like, well, someday I'm going to use that. Exactly. Or the kids will use it for something or whatever. Exactly. Yep. Well, Devin, thank you so much for being on the program. This has been such a joy. It's, I love connecting with entrepreneurs. Love meeting new people. It's just fantastic. So thanks, Devin, for being on the program. Absolutely. It's been a blast to be on. That was a great show. Hey, if you're enjoying Entrepreneur's Enigma, please give us a review on the podcast directory of your choice. We're on all of them. And these reviews really help others find the show. Also, if you're getting value from the show and want to buy me a coffee, go to the show notes and click on the link to help me stay awake while I bring you more great episodes to your ears. That's in the show notes, and I look forward to the next episode. Take care, guys. hopes you have enjoyed this episode. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Dan Farkas hosts a great podcast called The Strategic Communicator. Dan, tell us what these fine folks will hear when they listen. Jason, it's pretty simple. The Strategic Communicator podcast talks with industry leaders about emerging trends and how we can use various forms of communication to make the world a better place. Anyone listening will leave with tangible ideas you can use to help with your PR and marketing efforts. Amazing. Where can people subscribe? Easy. You can go to passpr.com. You can find the show at marketingpodcast.net or just search the Strategic Communicator with Dan Farkas wherever you get your podcast. You heard him, folks. Go get it. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.